Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome into the LDS preview edition of the Batter Up podcast here on the Sports Insanity Network, sponsored by the Dugout of Millwood. I am Mike Rifkin. We're here. We're finally here. LDS time. We'll preview the four LDSs. We'll talk a little bit about the wild card series. And then on the back end, we'll talk about some uh, managerial and front office stuff that has taken place throughout the world of Major League Baseball over the last week. Uh, but I got to start with something that happened during the wild card series and one series in particular. The Twins and the Blue Jays. And the Twins win in a sweep. They win in two games. But I got to talk about the John Schneider decision uh, in game two to take Jose Barrios out of that ball game when he was flat out dealing in the, I think it was the fourth inning. Uh, just to check that. But Barrios was dealing. He was pitching very, very well. And to have him get taken out of that game is – it's upsetting for someone who's not a Blue Jays fan. Like me, if you're just a baseball fan. Barrios went three innings, three hits. One of the runs that was scored goes on his record. Uh, one walk, five circuits. He threw 47 bitches. So my question for John Schneider, and, and forgive me if this was asked of him after the game, what are you thinking? And who made this decision? Did John Schneider make this decision? Or did some guy with a computer in an office somewhere make that decision? The guy, Barrios was pitching great. Why would you ever take him out of that game? Because he walked a hitter? This isn't like he was getting, I get your seasons on the line, but that guy has been a stud for you most of the year. 11 and 12 records on grade 365 ERA, 184 strikeouts. But he was rolling. He was really good. And if you didn't want to pitch him, then you don't pitch him. You pitch Chris Bassett or someone else. I don't understand it. And you didn't even go to a real reliever. You bring in UC Kikuchi, who hasn't pitched out of the bullpen all year. So I don't understand that. I get where the game is going with all these analytics stuff and the number stuff. But at some point, and this has been my biggest argument against analytics, and they work. I'm not going to sit here and say they don't work. Analytics work to an extent. But you have to have a feel for the game. If you don't have that feel for the game, why are you the manager? Because at the same time, you're just a puppet for the front office. I say the same thing about Aaron Boone with the Yankees. He is a puppet for the front office because he'll listen to what they have to say about the analytics. Gabe Kapler, because of analytics. And guess what that got him? That got him canned. I think you could put the Toronto Blue Jays in the same category, in my opinion, as the San Diego Padres, as the New York Mets, as any team you had a high expectation for. The Toronto Blue Jays are a disappointment this year because they are not playing in the LDS. And I get it, Toronto, you're used to disappointment. You watch the Maple Leafs play in April all the time. But it really gets to me because this guy was pitching really well and he gets it taken away from him because either his manager didn't believe in him or some guy with a, a, a computer told him he couldn't do it. That frustrates me. And now, guess what? The Toronto Blue Jays enter this offseason with as much, with as many questions as any other team. They don't have a real DH. Matt Chapman, their third baseman, he's a free agent. They're not going to pay him because he's going to get a lot of money. So now they don't have a center fielder. Kevin Kiermaier is a free agent. Now whether they bring him back or not remains to be seen. You know, what are they going to do in the bullpen, which has always been which has been their bugaboo the last number of years? Whit Merrifield, who's a productive player for them, he's a free agent. 
I don't think he's coming back. So now the, the one thing I know about the Blue Jays going into next year, um, Barrios and Chris Bassett are going to be in that rotation. Alec Manoa, I have no idea where the Alec Manoa thing lies. Because if he didn't report to AAA back in August, I, I would think he's trade, traded on Gosman. So Gosman, Bassett, Barrios. That's what I know. I, that's the rotation right now. That's top three. Bullpen, question mark. Vladdy's at first. Bichette's at short. George Springer's in right. And Dalton Varsho plays somewhere, and Kirk is probably your catcher. But you need to figure out maybe the back half of that rotation. Oh, Kikuchi's probably in there. So you need a number five starter. You need bullpen help. And then you need to figure out what this team is going to look like. But here's the question I think the front office has to ask itself. Can I win with John Schneider? Because if I can't win with John Schneider, then why is he the manager of this ball club? And I don't like calling for people's jobs because I don't know if this was his call or some guy with a computer's call on taking out burritos. But I don't like it. I, I just don't like it. You have to have a feel for the game. And if you don't have a feel for the game, why are you in this line of work? You know who has a perfect example for analytics? The Rays. I'll get to them in a minute, but but they Kevin Cash lets the analytics talk, but he also has some feel for a game minus game six of the 2020 World Series. That's a whole nother conversation. But it's just, to me, you're in that moment. If Jose Brios gives you the best chance to win, you leave him in. If he doesn't, why did he start the game in the first place? That's the question. We're fired up on that. It doesn't make sense. Let it make some so, some form of sense, John Schneider. Toronto Blue Jays. So the Blue Jays are a disappointment. The Rays got off to that great start this year. They f- came back to earth. Now, they get swept by Texas. Texas' offense came to play, and the Rays' bats went silent. But I'm not even going to get into the, the – the, the, I'll get to the games in a second. Rays fans, it's the playoffs. How are you not filling up the trap? How? I don't want to hear anything about the start time. I don't want to hear anything about any other – anything else. It is the playoffs, and that should be a filled stadium. They couldn't fill it. They couldn't fill it. Now, here, here's the challenge, Rays fans. You're getting your wish because you're going to get a new ballpark in a couple of years. If your team's in the playoffs and you don't fill that thing up, I got to talk relocation at some point because that shows to me you don't care. And what would be the point of having a team there if you don't care? But on the on-field product, look, Tyler Glass now was – was pretty good in game one. Defense let him down. The offense let him down. Game two, Eflin was pretty good the first couple of innings. Then the Rangers offense woke up. Uh, Tampa's got some questions. Tampa's got some questions going in, in, into next year. I like their core for the most part with a Rosarena, Diaz, Lau. Uh, I still think they can use one real impact bat in the middle of that lineup. And when I say an impact bat, I, I'm talking a guy who could hit you 30 homers. Um, because these guys, a lot of it is speed and put the ball in play. If they get a thumper in the middle of the lineup, look out. And I think they need a rota- They need a piece in the rotation. I do believe they do need a rotational piece. Because we don't know when Shane McClanahan's coming back. You know, Eflin was – pretty good most of the year. Savali when he came over was up and down. Um, what's Tyler Glasnow's future there? I, I've heard some rumblings around that. Uh, but yeah, so so the Rays have some questions. 
The Blue Jays have a ton of questions. The Milwaukee Brewers have a ton of questions after they got swept by the Diamondbacks. Um, what's the future of Craig Council? I do not love the fact that that was asked of him right after game two um, because you can't give him that question. Now, when it's lock or clean out there, you want to give him that question, that's fine with me. But t- 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it was after a game where his season comes to an end, and you're asking him, Craig, what's your future look like? I don't like that question. I don't like it because you know what the answer is going to be. And if he sits there and says, yeah, I'm not coming back, that, then that, then that's Craig Council's way. But if it, you could see the emotion on Craig Council's face if you watch that video of when the question was asked of him. So I don't like the question. Let him, let him feel this thing out. Let, let him, you know, he's upset. His team just got swept. And they played pretty well, you, you know. Got things you thought would, would happen. Uh, things you thought wouldn't happen happen. Corbin Burns got beat up after getting a lead. Burr Bullpen got beat up after getting a lead. Uh, and give the Dimebacks a ton of credit. And the Dimebacks are feisty, and they're young, and they're hungry. So, you, you know, it, it, it's w- w- the Brewers. They have questions. What's going to happen with Craig Council? What's going to happen with Corbin Burns? How is Brandon Woodruff's shoulder? Uh, You know, what are they going to look like next year? And then you got the Phillies who just beat the snot out of the Marlins. And look, for the Marlins, it's a good year. Um, I I won't take anything away. They, They went up against a heavyweight. And I can't sit here and belittle the Marlins. They had a very good year. Sandy Alcantara didn't even pitch his best baseball this year. And they found a way in. Again, uh, the Marlins like the Rays. I think they need another big bat in that lineup. Uh, Jake Berger's going to give them something next year. Solaire, if he's back. Jazz Chisholm, if he could stay healthy, would be ex- is excellent. But I still think they need one more middle of the order bat um, to say, okay, we're a real threat. Maybe someone like a, a Teoscar Hernandez fits their role, fits that role. Um, maybe, maybe they, because the kind of player they would sign is a Whit Merrifield. I just don't think that's a need for them. I, I wonder if they would gauge interest in, in someone who might be on the, the market trade-wise. Uh, but the rotation should be fine next year without, if Alcantara is healthy. Bullpen needs some work. But if they can get that one big bat, they're not going to be in the class of the Phillies and the Braves. But there's no reason why they couldn't get back to the playoffs if they just get that one big bat. Uh, that, that I think they need. So... Those are the opinions of, of the teams who, who are now out in the wild, out because of the wild card. But it's a good year for the Marlins, and it's tough for the other three. Um, and I'm highly disappointed in the Blue Jays, very highly disappointed. So with that being said, let's go to the LCSs. We'll start in the American League Um because we got the Rangers and the Orioles. The two teams actually split their season series 3-3. So this is a somewhat of an even matchup. Texas in the in, uh, in the six games averaged 4.3 runs per game, uh, a 3.71 starters ERA. And here's the big one for Texas, a 1.89 bullpen ERA. So they got Baltimore before their bullpen issues. But – the way they're playing, the way they played against Tampa, look at uh, Baltimore, 3.2 runs per game, 4.80 starters ERA, 3.13 bullpen ERA. Baltimore's in a tricky spot. These starting pitchers outside of Kyle Gibson have never been in this spot. Bullpen, very different because Felix Bautista is out. He's undergoing Tommy John. He's out for an extra two. So the bullpen's in a different spot too. The Orioles just don't have the experience here. So they can play this very loosely. As good as they are, 
they could be very, very loose about how they play this series. Um, some numbers from particular players. Corey Seager hit 160 against Baltimore this year. But he's been a big-time playoff performer in the past. He had a good series against uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, Josh Young hit 435 against Baltimore with a home run of four RBIs. How about this for for Baltimore? Gunnar Henderson, probably your AL Rookie of the Year, hit 133 with a homer. Anthony Santander, who had a really nice year, he went 0 for Texas. He, he didn't have a hit. Uh, Adley Rutschman was their big bat, 304. A home run in RBI, but listen, this should be an offensive showcase for both teams. Two very talented teams and differently. Uh, it should be an offensive showcase, both teams. One very young team, one team with experience, Seager, Simeon. I'm excited about the pitching, though. I, I want to see what the Baltimore starters bring out. And the, I think the difference maker, and he's the ultimate X factor here, Bruce Bochy. Bruce Bochy's the X factor. Been there. He's got the experience. Brandon Hyde hasn't. It, it, it's been a great year in Baltimore. I, I think Texas pulls this out. I do. Um, I'd love to see Baltimore win. I would love to see Baltimore win. Um, but I'm going to take – I'll say Texas and sit. It, it, Texas, I, I just – I just think Texas is the team um, in this series. If Baltimore wins, listen, I'll give them all the credit in the world. I, I think this will take all five. I'll, I'll go Texas in five. Um, I think this is a tough one. This is pro this and Atlanta Philly are going to be the two toughest for me. But I'm going to take Texas in five. Love what Baltimore's doing. If Baltimore wins, hats off to them. I, I just think Texas is right now. I, I, I like Texas. Then you got Houston and Minnesota. Minnesota. Won four of six from Houston this year, which is which is very on Houston. Like Royce Lewis, uh, limited couple of games, but he had a home run, hit three thirty three against Houston, which I, I mean he he's he crushed Toronto. Uh, Houston, Altuve struggled a little bit, uh, hit a buck forty three with a home run, couple of RBIs against Minnesota. This comes down to two things for me. This is Carlos Correa against his old team, and that's not what it comes down to. But which starting pitching is going to be better? And I'm going to ride with Houston. Uh, I, I'm riding Houston. Verlander, Valdez, Javier is as good as it gets. Uh, Sonny Gray was awesome in game two. Uh, Pablo Lopez was great in game one for Minnesota against Toronto. Uh, this Houston team is just different for me uh, in the postseason. Altuve, Bregman, Kyle Tucker, who still might be the most underappreciated player in baseball. Uh, Jordan Alvarez. Abreu ended the year red hot. So if Jose Abreu's coming into the, the playoffs as hot as he was ending the season, I, I think that's an X factor for Houston. I like Houston. There's pressure on Houston. There's not really pressure on Minnesota. Kind of like in the Baltimore, Texas series. There's pressure on Baltimore, but you, you know, I, I like Minnesota. I, I like I like Houston. I like Houston in four. Um, I, I think they won this series three three one. Uh, the pitching is going to be fine. Love the bullpen. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think people are sleeping on the Houston Astros, and I got to tell you that. Like, I get it; they didn't have the regular season that everybody wanted them to have. Win 110 ball games, this, that, the third, but they're in, and they're in. And think of who they start in the first two: Justin Verlander, who out of any, give me any starting pitcher in the playoffs. 
Who would you want taking the ball in game one? I'll take Justin Verlander. Baltimore wishes they had Verlander in game one. Texas wishes they had Verlander in game one. Minnesota wishes they had Verlander in game one. Nationally, Arizona wishes they had Verlander in game one. The Dodgers wish they had Verlander in game one. Maybe not so much Philly or Atlanta, but uh, no, because actually Philly might because they they I don't think they could pitch uh, Wheeler or Nola because they pitched the the wild card games. So I'm not sure Philly's announced who started. Uh, so, so maybe just Atlanta, but I, I like Houston. Nationally, the, the National League is weird, and the National League is it's an NL West showdown and it's an NL East showdown. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the, the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks because the other one's just a heavyweight matchup. Uh, the Dodgers were eight and five against the Diamondbacks this season. Mookie Betts did his thing, he had two homers, five RBIs. Freddie Freeman hit 389 with three homers at six RBIs against the Diamondbacks for the Diamondbacks. Corbin Carroll uh, hit a buck 96, two homers, four RBIs against the Dodgers. Christian Walker hit 234. This comes down to the pitching for me. Uh, offensively, I know what the Dodgers are. Offensively, I know what the Diamondbacks are. If the Dodgers starting pitching struggles and they're going to have Bobby Miller in game two and Clayton Kershaw in game one, and, and listen, I love Clayton Kershaw. He's a future Hall of Famer. Um, he's one of the best pitchers of his generation. But we've always questioned him in the playoffs. And if there's any year to get to the Dodgers, it's this year because of that pitch. We don't know. If Kershaw's bad in game one, Bobby Miller hasn't been there. Uh, you know, I, I think I read Lance Lynn is the likely guy for game three. We'll wait on that. But Arizona comes in, listen. Arizona's got Merrill Kelly probably in game one. Then they could get Gallon for either two or three after he pitched game two of the wildcard series. Arizona's Arizona can do this. I just can't bet against the Dodgers here. I'm going to take the Dodgers in four. Uh, I think it's a tight series. I think the Dodgers are just too much for the Diamondbacks. That's why I would go Dodgers over D-backs here. Uh, and then you, then you come to this heavyweight showdown of Braves-Phillies. And the Braves beat the Phillies 8 out of 13. Uh, the Phillies struggled, man, pitching. 488 starters ERA, 4.70 ERA. Brave started struggle too. They had an ERA over four. Bullpen was at 3.47. And we know the Braves offense is it's deadly. Acuna at 339, four homers, 10 RBIs. Matt Olson had six homers against Philly. Um, for the Phillies, uh, Bryce Harper at five homers. Schwarber hit two homers. JT Real Muto hit under 200 with a home run and two RBIs. But the big Philly bat against the Braves was Nick Castellanos. He had 294, four homers, nine RBIs, eight runs scored in 13 games. So the depth of the Philly lineup. is going to be the depth of both lineup. The depth of both lineups is the big thing. And here's the other question. Which which pick? Uh, which starting pitching do you believe in more? Do you believe in the Braves pitching more, or do you believe in the Phillies pitching more? Uh, Strider's had an amazing year. Freed, when he's healthy, he's really good. They're not going to have Charlie Morton here. That's a huge loss. I still like the Braves. I I, I like the Braves. I think this is a pick 'em. I'm going to go Atlanta and five. I think the big thing for me would be home field. And I just don't, I wonder if this, and listen, here's the other motivating fact for me on the Braves. Last year has to play a factor. They cannot overlook a Philly team that beat them last year in, in the, in this round. They can't overlook that. Um, 
I think they won't. I think the job Brian Snitker done has done is sh- straight up phenomenal. Um, but this team has the depth. They have Ozzy Albies back. Riley had a great year. Arcia was Orlando Arcia was an All Star after they let Dancy Swanson walk. I, I I just think there's too much depth here. I think Philly plays them very tight. I wonder if the buy comes into play for any of these series. Does the buy affect the higher seed? I don't think it affects a team like Houston, a little bit of an older team, so they can get their rest. I don't think it should have that kind of effect. But I wonder a team like the Braves if it would have an effect. A team like uh, Baltimore, who kind of might be anxious to play. I wonder if it bothers them. If not, it doesn't. I, these are just questions. So, all right. So, the, listen, we got the Rangers. I got the Rangers in five. I've got the Astros in, in four. I have the Dodgers in four. I have the Braves in five. I think you're going to see some long series here in the LDS, which sets up Dodgers, Braves, Rangers, Astros in the LCS. I, I think that'd be great. So, that, that's that on the LDS stuff. Uh, now to cover bases on some other stuff. Uh, we'll start with the Mets. Because David Stearns was brought in. You know, I talked about that in the last episode. But Thursday, Billy Epler announced he was resigning. Now it's come out that Billy Epler is under MLB investigation for manipulating the injured list or something along those lines. And I've heard talk radio in New York, like only the Mets can do this, only this. From what I've read, it seems like every team every team does this. So why, why Billy Epler and why now? And who, who, who dropped the dime? And, and that would be my question, is why now is Major League Baseball investigating this? And who dropped the – if this is something that's been going on, then baseball needs to look at a lot of other teams and look at how they view the, the injured list. And if it's something they got to fight, Major League Baseball, then go ahead and fight it. But somebody dropped the dime on Billy Epler. Now, I'll be totally honest here. I'm not – I'm not in the mode of – Billy Epler had to stay. Billy Epler had to go. I, I I care less if Billy Epler was the Mets GM or not. Um, because I think at the end of the day, this was going to be the David Stern show, regardless of Billy Epler. But I do have some questions on why. Uh, who's gonna? Is David Stern's going to run the show himself now for a year? Is he going to bring someone he knows in? Uh, because I'd like to have a GM in place, and then I'd like to have a manager in place before you know they start getting into free agency. By the way, there'll be an article on the website coming maybe early next week on names David Stearns could look for in a trade, free agency, at free agents I'd like to see him sign. Uh, myself and the old ops guy are working on that right now. I, I'm. I would like to know who dropped the dime on Billy Epler. Because personally, does it bother me? No. Um, I wonder if it was. Was it Buck? Was it Buck Showalter getting revenge? And Buck. Buck was like, B- Billy didn't want me to be here. I don't want Billy to be there. So I'm gonna take Billy down with me. Um, I'm not insinuating Buck did do it. I'm just having a little bit of fun. There was also the Post article that said Epler and Showalter, they butted heads over Daniel Vogelback's place in the lineup. Um, So I'm okay with Billy Epler not being there. I I am. We'll we'll see what happens with the Mets coming up. Then there's the Padres, who announced that both general manager A.J. Preller returning and manager Bob Melvin will return next year. Uh, I'm, I'm for it. I'm for Bob Melvin staying. As much as I'd love to see him have been the Mets manager, um, I would have liked that a couple of years ago, too, when they went the buck route, which was fine as well. I like Bob Melvin. Did the Padres underachieve this year? Absolutely. Absolutely the Padres underachieved. But 
I, I'm not making excuses, but there were times Machado was out. Crone North didn't have the year you thought he'd have. So, uh, Soto. Tatis missed some time. Darvish, Mus- Musgrove, they missed time. Hader wasn't great this year. So the Padres, I think, have to change their identity a little bit. I think they have too many stars. And that sounds like the weirdest thing a guy could say, someone could say about a team. But it doesn't work. Unless you're playing basketball, those all-star teams, they just don't work. Uh, unless you're the 9 Yankees. And, and even that, you know, if, you know, and A-Rod admitted the other Nick, other night that the Mauer ball is fair. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but th- these all teams don't work. So I wonder what that means for Juan Soto, who's entering the final year of his contract. I wonder if they explore some other deals. I don't think Hater's back there. So they're going to have to figure that out sooner rather than later. But at least they're going to continue the stability with Preller and Melvin. But I'll say this. If they get off to a slow start next year, I wonder if they would just fire Bob Melvin. I do. I, I I put that one in the back of my head, back of my mind. Then there's the Angels. I, I'm not sure if I brought this up on the last one. If not, I'm bringing it up now. Phil Nevin's not coming back. I have a hard time blaming Phil Nevin for what happened with the Angels this year. Um, Their starting pitching, I don't think, is very good outside of Shohei Otani. I don't think their lineup's really good outside of Otani and Trout when he's healthy. It's Phil Nevin's fault Anthony Rendon got hurt. It's Phil Nevin's fault that Logan O'Hoppy got hurt. It's Phil Nevin's fault that you're, you're... Starting rotation isn't good, and you relied on guys who don't have a track record. This is all on Phil Nevin, when in reality it's all in the front office. They signed Tyler Anderson to a bit uh, to a three year, I think it was thirty eight million dollar contract. Tyler Anderson's a good pitcher, but he's a four or a five on some teams. He's not a one or a two. He's a back end of the rotation guy. So how did your rotation line up this year? Otani's at one. Griffin Canning, young guy, okay. Sandoval, young guy, okay. Anderson, to me, like that, you're hoping on on three of those guys. You're even hoping on Anderson because the Dodgers do this all the time with reclamation projects. They they do a good job, and when they leave, they're not the same. Couple of exceptions. Justin Turner had a pretty good year in Boston. But pitching-wise, I don't know. I, I to, and, and listen, I, I'm going to go back to the deadline when they bought Giolito. They bought uh, the outfielders they brought in. Matt Moore came in and just didn't work. And then they put all those guys they brought in on waivers to go under the luxury tax. I don't think it worked. I have problems with where the Angels are. Otani's not coming back. And you're going to get nothing for him. You're, you're going to attach the QO to him. It doesn't matter. The qualifying offer to him. It doesn't matter. He's gone. He's. I don't think he resigns there. Now the question becomes, what do you do with Trout? He's got eight years left on that deal. Over 200 million bucks. If you're going to sell the team, if Artie Murray is going to sell the team, does a new owner want to come in with Mike Trout or does he want to start things over? And if you trade Trout, here's the question you'd have to ask. How much do I have to retain on Trout? Or is there an owner out there who is willing to eat every penny on the contract of Mike Trout? And there are very few owners who would want it, who, who could do it. Or who want to do it? That's the question. Who would want to do it? And then there's a case of Trout. Where does he want to go? Where does he want to be? Because usually when you trade a, a guy like that, when you trade a guy like a Mike Trout, you work with him and see where he wants to go. 
So that's going to take out some of the names of the in, in the league. If I'm an Angels fan, the, the right now the only good thing about the Angels is you're close to Disneyland. Right now, again, I have nothing good to say about the Los Angeles Angels right now because I think the whole thing is a mess. And if a new owner comes in, then I think a new GM's got to come in and a new manager's coming in. By the way, I still have the Rendon contract. But that with Josh Hamilton, with C.J. Wilson, with all the other bad contracts the Angels have signed over the years. The Angels wasted five years of Shohei Otani. The Angels wasted Mike Trapp. Wasted them. And you want us to feel good about where this team's supposed to be? People go to the ballpark to watch Trout and Otani. I feel worse about the Angels than I do the Oakland A's. I think about how bad they were this year. You put a Trout or Otani in Oakland, they're filling up the Coliseum. The Angels have both of them, and they wasted them. And this comes after a couple of years where they did people dirty. They did Albert Pools dirty. Let's be real honest. Signed Albert Pools' 10-year contract. They knew what they signed him for, the historical home runs. Then when he was when they thought he was done, they they got rid of him. He goes to the Dodgers, didn't work. He goes to St. Louis, and boom, he hit 700. Uh, uh, listen. Angels fans, I feel for you. I don't know what you did, but your owner, not there. The GM, listen, I, I get Perry Manasian's point. You don't want to be the GM who trades Shohei Otani. I think you look at that in the mirror now and, and go, I was wrong. That's a problem. If you had traded Otani, you could have, replenished your farm system. You could have brought in some young talent. Hindsight's twenty twenty, but not a good look for the Angels. Oh, all right, one more time. I'm just going to go over the LDS picks. Rangers over the Orioles. I'm going to go five in that one. Astros over Twins in four. Dodgers over Diamondbacks four. Braves over the Phillies in five. Those are the picks for the LDS. So what's going to happen is after all the LDSs are up, I'll preview the LCSs. And any other news that comes down, we'll talk here on Batter Up. But go to the website, www.thesportsentinetwork.com for your blogs, vlogs, planes, trains, and automobiles. Follow us on the socials, Facebook, Twitter, at S Insanity Real. Yeah, so until next time, I am Mike Rifkin. Thank you for listening for to this edition of the Batter Up Podcast, part of the Sport of Sanity Network, sponsored by the Dugout of Millwood. Enjoy the LDSs, folks, and we'll be back to talk LCS.